Welcome, Duvid here. Streaming again tonight. I signed up for uh, another debate with uh, JF on the public space. They'll be starting uh, tomorrow at 7 on vegetarianism, an issue that uh, is very close to me. I've been a vegetarian now for over five years, although I had to eat and meat the majority of my life. And I'd wanted to, uh, I've, I've been researching this and debating this for years. And many people follow my channel. You see all the Hare Krishna stuff and uh, I mean, I have a video from the Hare Krishna Temple, a presentation on vegetarianism from the children there, but I wanted just to keep academic and on point, so I signed up for another debate with JF to keep my research and uh, academics going, and uh, I thought vegetarianism would be a good topic, so tonight I'm going to go over and... Uh, Talk about vegetarianism, and we're going to you know, look at uh, mostly scientific evidence. We're going to look at uh, the health effects of vegetarianism, the ecological and environmental uh, factors that come into vegetarianism, and some of the moral ethics. And uh, I'm not sure what kind of crowd I'm going to have, so I figure I'll just start by reading some quotes. So let me enter screen share here, and uh, and I'll just start by reading some famous quotes, you know, there's a lot of vegetarians over the days, over the, you know, the periods of time. So here's a nice source I gathered together of uh, quotes about vegetarianism back through history. Let me just make sure this is working right. Okay, so let's go straight into some quotes. McCartney, you can judge a man's true character by the way he treats his fellow animals. Um, Leo Tolstoy, Tolstoy, a man can live and be healthy without killing animals for food. Therefore, if he eats meat, he participates in taking animal life merely for the sake of his appetite and to act so is immoral. Leonardo da Vinci, I from an early age abjured the use of meat at the time and the time will come when men such as I will look upon the murder of animals as they now look upon the murder of men. Franz Kafka, now I can take a look at you in peace. I do not eat you anymore. Albert Einstein is my view that vegetarian manner of living, by its purely physical effect on the human temperament, would most beneficially influence the lot of mankind. Okay, sorry, I haven't done this in a while. I've got to get used to talking. So I'm doing the practice video. Uh, you know. Edison, nonviolence leads to the highest ethics, which is the goal of all evolution. Until we stop harming all other living beings, we are still savages. Isaac Beresheva Singer, people often say that humans have always eaten animals as if this is a justification for continuing the practice. According to this logic, we should not try to prevent people from murdering other people since this has also been done since the earliest of times. Ralph Walter, Waldo Emerson, you have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed, in the graceful distance of miles there is complicity. Plutarch. So there were, there were a lot of ancients. We'll be going over some of the history. Plutarch, a human body in no way resembles those that were born for raveness. It hath no hawk bill, no sharp talon, no roughness of teeth, no such strength of stomach or heat of digestion, and can be sufficient to convert or alter such heavy and fleshy fare. But if you will contend that you were born to an inclination to such food as you have now in mind to eat, do you then yourself kill what you would eat? But do it yourself without the help of a chopping knife, a mallet, or axe, as wolves, bears, and lions do. Who kill and eat at once, rend an ox with thy teeth, worry a hog with thy mouth, tear a lamb or a hare into pieces, and fall on and eat it alive as they do. But if thou had rather say until what thou eat is to become dead, and if thou art loath to force a soul out of its body, when thou dost thou against nature eat an animate an animate thing. There is nobody that will be willing to eat even a lifeless and dead thing, 
even as it is, so they boil it and roast it and alert it by fire and medicines, as it were, charging and quenching the slaughtered gore with thousands of sweet sauces that the palate being thereby deceived may admit of such uncalled fare. So I, I won't read some of the more common ones, you know, Gandhi, uh, and to read some of the lesser set over quotes. Benjamin Franklin, my refusing to eat flesh occasioned and inconveniently, and I was frequently chided for my singularity, but with this lighter repast, I made the greater progress for greater clearness of head and quicker comprehension. Flesh eating is unprovoked murder. Roseanne Barr, to expect life to treat you good is foolish as hoping a bull won't hit you because you are a vegetarian. Bill Muller, I wouldn't touch a hot dog unless you put a condom on it. You realize that the job of a hot dog is to use parts of the animal that the Chinese can't figure out how to make into a belt. So obviously, uh, you modern entertainers, a lot of them famous for being vegetarian, Oscar Wilde, you can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. It's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does except vegetarians and people like that. So I guess this one is collecting also just... Uh, Quotes that include it. Sorry about that. Just include the word document, uh, vegetarian. More Plutarch. But for the sake of some little mouthful of flesh, we deprive a soul of the sun and light and of that proportion of life and time it had been born into the world to enjoy. Or Jeef. Meat is necessary when there is hard physical work to be done or in very cold climate or when edible plants cannot be found, animal flesh provides all of the substances we need both for the intensive working of our organism and for maintaining a normal temperature in cold climates. Thomas Jefferson, I've lived temperately eating little animal food and that not as an, align, uh, an alignment so much as a condiment for the vegetables which constitute my principal diet. Okay, you get the idea. So, I mean, there's a lot of vegetarian. There's a lot of quotes. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of the history, but I just thought I'd open up with some uh, quotes. You know, I, I haven't streamed for a while, so uh, um, just got to get used to talking, and, and uh, you we're going to go over some evidence. So let's look at a history of vegetarianism, and then I'm going to get into some scientific studies, and I got a few PowerPoints. So the main thing I wanted to get my uh, mindset for uh, the debate tomorrow and have these words fresh on my tongue. And sorry, the holiday just ended. People saw my streams this week. So uh, I got to get back into the streaming mode of just talking intellectual nonstop. So I apologize about the low quality of this. So here's a, just a nice graphic history. And this page actually is podcasts, like 30-minute talks on each of these topics. You're looking at the origin of... Uh, Vegetarianism, Ahimsa in ancient India. You know, presumably, India has been largely vegetarian throughout the majority of history. As anyone who follows my channel knows my interest in uh, Vedic and Hindu Indian philosophy. But there's also schools of uh, vegetarianism in the West. You know, Pythagoras, who believed in reincarnation and uh, recommended uh, vegetarianism. Interesting topics on that. I encourage people to look more into that. Um, you know, the East, uh, King uh, Ashoka, classical Rome, there were few vegetarians, including uh, early, early Christians and pagans, and the, especially the Gnostics. A vegetarian was pretty popular among the Gnostics. You get the debates within the church, uh, heresies, uh, you, what is. Uh, the sanction to eat meat or not? Do, are we sanctioned to eat meat by God? The Renaissance. So if anyone wants a resource, uh, this nice resource with podcasts, here's another nice resource. Uh, the 
International Vegetarian Union, and this also has a history in Pythagoras, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, Schopenhauer, uh, Shelley, uh, Wagner, Tolstoy, and Besant, uh, Kellogg, George Bernard Shaw, quotes, history. I encourage you, know, I had time to flip through some of these. I hope other people will have some time. So I guess I'm going to do a few uh, I'm going to do a few PowerPoints, and then I'm going to go straight into the scientific studies. Okay, so I, I looked through. I tried to find some good ones that are, that are going to go, and then we'll see the studies that cover this. Um, you know, So this one we're talking about environmental. So what's the best thing that a single person could do for the environment? And if they eat beef, presumably giving up on beef is the most substantial a thing that we could do for the environment. The biggest damager to the environment today done by man is largely through beef eating. And, uh, you know, so this is more from your global warming environmental perspective, which is actually very popular in, uh, in Europe, as opposed to the Indian, more theological old school, the more modern day European uh, environmental concern of, and health concern of uh, vegetarianism. So the most effective action we can take as individuals for the survival of the planet, reduce meat and dairy consumption. Although actually I will argue that dairy consumption is good. Um, but, uh, you know, here's a chart about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see that uh, a lot of it's produced from uh, livestock. 18% of greenhouse gas emission comes from livestock. That's, uh, according to this, the biggest single sector of any of them. The biggest uh, contribution to greenhouse gases is actually industrialized meat. You know, you look at methane, we'll talk about this more. Uh, methane is, uh, you know, 23 times hotter than CO2. Um, you may last longer in the... Ozone for people who study the science, you know, maybe we could go more into that, but I just say that methane is uh, comes from uh, cows and a major cause of global warming. And it's said that uh, cow eating the cow is the number one source of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions. The more statistics. So eating meat is the leading cause of global warming. Most devastating effect of rising temperatures and melting ice. So this this one's largely on global warming. Um, but I, I just wanted to show some of the evidence for the benefits of vegetarian towards the environment. Livestock industry, biodiversity. Livestock takes up 30% of the Earth's land surface, which was once habitat for wildlife, tropical forests hold half the world's species, which are becoming extinct at alarming rate due to deforestation for meat production. 53% of global fish meal production is used by the livestock sector for feed, seriously affecting the world's fish population. In the uh, university, I did, uh, most students do what's called a carbon footprint. You say, how do we live? How big is our house? Where do we drive? What do we eat? And how much land does it require to provide us that way of living? And obviously it takes a lot of land um, to produce these livestock that we eat, and that's a serious uh, strain on the environment, causing deforestation and extinction, and uh, the requirement of raising other things like fish or grains in order to feed these livestock. And we're going to get more into these details. Water pollution, unfortunately, livestock production is the largest sectorial source of water pollutants. Uh, unfortunately, my grandparents had a stream in their backyard that used to have uh, fish swimming in it in uh in missouri but eventually a chicken factory came in and that led to the pollution and there were no more fish so uh a lot of environmental damage caused by meat eating and even though you know the cow is the worst for the environment uh you know chicken slaughterhouses uh cause a lot of uh, water damage deforestation as we mentioned they're gonna make room for these animals they got to make room for the grains in farm to feed the animals so they you know, become big and, and produce a lot of meat. And uh, unfortunately, we've been cutting down forest in order to do that. Um, you know, the uh, 
meat eating is probably the largest cause of deforestation in the world. So I encourage people to look through these. Water scarcity. We use a lot of water for this meat eating. And it it's a big drain of, of water for people who, are, who don't have water or different sources. And later we're going to look into, um, you know, could the earth support 50 million, 50 billion people if we were all vegetarian? The studies on that. You know, agriculture uses 70% of all water use on the planet. So when you think if we were all vegetarian and cut out livestock, um, how much more water we would have. Obviously, the meat and dairy industries are among the biggest contributors to the problem of water scarcity, overuse, and population. We look at water efficiency. Entire vegan, uh, you know, here you got uh, the graph of uh, chicken or beef and how much water and, you know, uh, how much water liters of water it takes for for beef. And it's uh, It's ridiculous. you know, all the soy used to feed animals. And we're going to look more into some studies that uh, get more into detail. But, you know, I just wanted to jump in with some of the better visuals that I was able to find on this. You know, so is the number of people on the planet right now? Seven billion people. Thirteen percent are going hungry. Um, grain and soy production. And you see that... Uh, 40% of it is used to feed animals that are to meat eating. So obviously, if everyone was vegetarian, there would be significantly larger amounts of food to feed everybody. And we're going to look at some of those projections in the scientific studies. In world hunger, grain fed to animals, reared for human consumption, loses 90% of the energy from the original grain. Conversion and efficiency of meat production, 16 pounds of grains to produce one pound of beef. Unfortunately, meat eating is increasing, not decreasing. So I just encourage people to look through these slides and I'm going to be reading from some studies. I'm sorry, I haven't streamed like this for a few weeks. So I just got to get you know, back into it, less dead time, more professional. So that's why I'm doing a prep stream for tomorrow. And uh, usually I do this like after the event, but I figure I do it before. So the evidence and the studies would be up there for people. And you know, obviously I'll timestamp this and add the links to the studies after the video is posted. And I actually disagree. I support dairy. So this study is also against dairy. But you know, look at uh, the data here, and we'll see how the milk is produced. Um, that uh, you know, we'll talk about that more. Carnegie Mellon University research found that eating vegan food one day per work per week saves more emissions than eating locally grown food all year. And we're going to look at some of the health benefits of vegetarianism, just read them now. So, we, you know, meat-free diet, prevent high blood pressure, lower cholesterol levels, reduce type 2 diabetes, prevent stroke conditions, reverse arthrosclerosis, reduce heart disease risk 50%, reduce heart surgery risk 80%, prevent many forms of cancer, stronger immune system, increase life expectancy up to 15 years, higher IQ. Here's some more quotes. I was reading from earlier. Theodore Adorno. Auschwitz begins wherever someone looks at a slaughterhouse and thinks they're only animals. Okay, so I got a few more of these PowerPoints. Um, ben Noak asked me about Kaporis. Um, I've done Kaporis with chicken before in the past. Now I'm a vegetarian. I've switched to money. Um, I, I appreciate the Kaporis ritual and where it comes to, to actually being in contact in the Vedic scriptures mention about uh, you 
you when you kill an animal that you retake birth as the animal. So the Kapoor ritual has that statement that uh, you were transferring the sin that really I should go to death, um, but we transfer the sin onto the animal. And instead of me going to death, the animal goes to death. So I actually support the Kapoor ritual. If you in in uh, you know, generally that meat is, goes to serving the poor, and it's more you know you're direct you see the chicken that dies you know it's in your hand you hold it in your hand you could feel the fear you could feel its heart beating in your hand and uh you know you'll see the many quotes like uh, if you actually saw the slaughterhouse how much meat would you eat and i actually know quite a bit about the slaughter process i even knew uh you know shalom ravashkin who trump pardoned the uh, you know, his father Arnash ravashkin the kosher meat slaughter i know almost all the at least in the kosher world caterers and slaughterers and i know a lot about uh, i've been to slaughterhouses and know the process um so i would actually approve of the kapoor's ritual and say that to some extent all meat eaters should do that but we, we will talk about that more so let's do another powerpoint vegetarianism i probably should have done this one first that it would have been better sorry it wasn't organized enough you know the holiday just ended and i got the debate tomorrow and i'm not sure how busy i'm going to be tomorrow uh, so i just wanted to get get doing this so i'm sorry about the low quality hopefully i'll pick up it'll get better and then you know, people see this later be time stamped and uh so you know, jump in what about protein how can you get protein vegetarian diet protein doesn't just come in the form of meat vegetables contain over 20 percent protein some of the the gooms almost 30 percent grains 13 percent protein you can get plenty of protein from being a vegetarian medical costs associated with meat eating healthy heart lower blood pressure we'll look at the scientific studies that back the this data up easier digestion Prevention of cancer. You know, we look at studies of cancer rates. And there's a lot of studies that have tested this and studies with tens, even hundreds of thousands of people. Um, this is one of the most studied, scientifically studied thing is the health benefits of vegetarianism. Well, there's a lot of disputes in it and, uh, you know, also delve deeper into what is the empirical scientific method, how much can they tell it. But the, the health benefits of vegetarianism has been one of the most studied things in the last few decades. You know, emissions we talked about, not just methane, but that uh, come from uh, animal production, the waste products, air pollution, water pollution. I encourage people to pause these and read through these, or you'll see the studies later if you don't know this information. I've studied this for a while. I just want to have this fresh in my mind. Yeah, things like the carbon cycle, the trophic uh, cycles, trophic level levels that just logically demonstrate the implausibility of meat eating at the levels we do. And because obviously you have to feed the animal a lot of food and most of that doesn't go to building mass and it comes out as waste. So I mean, the simple logic for those who know more about science and digestion, but the, just the simple logic of the um, the carbon cycle and the waste of raising animals to be eaten and all the strain on the planet is causing. Energy use. The estimates of how much energy it takes to uh, make you so for a cup of vegetables it's talking about 0 0.01 gallons of equivalent gasoline and uh for the same amount of beef you're talking about 16 times more uh, energy and here they have it even larger if you look in uh, the increase in meat eating is is really uh worrying that uh you know everyone wants to eat meat these days in america like even poor people could eat meat three times a day I mean, you could go to uh, any restaurant and get your meat relatively cheap so even a poor person homeless person in america could expect to eat meat products three times a day and you know you see just the tonnage that uh 2007 was estimated that 284 million tons of meat was consumed your per capita consumptions doubled
they were looking at how much grain is required to produce it. So you say that your beef is by far the worst of all of them, then pig and turkey, and, and to some extent, uh, you know, uh, chicken isn't that bad. You know, eggs and chicken aren't that bad of a strain, although we talk about the water damage and pollution from those chicken factories, although the environmental strain of eating chicken is relatively not that bad. You look at the water, 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of meat, as opposed, that's 100 times more than the amount of water needed to produce a pound of wheat, and 10 times more than needed to produce a pound of soy. We talked about uh, deforestation and the land needed for this lifestyle, the damage to the soil, soil erosion, De, uh, turning desert desertification, destroying uh, soil. And uh, I've studied more of the science. If I, I hope to have those scientific terms on the top of my head to uh, accurately explain the scientific process of why uh, meat eating destroys soil. You know, we talked about biodiversity loss, ecosystem destruction. Okay, so I'm going to do another PowerPoint. You got Ben Noak. Uh, yeah, Kaporis, like, I mean, I'm going to save that more for Ask the Rabbi type stream, the Jewish ritual, because I, I want to focus more on the pure science of, uh, um, I want to focus more on the pure science of vegetarianism. I, I, hopefully my friend's watching and tell me he's uh, switching to vegetarianism. He's been thinking about it off and on for a while. I've been recommending it. So let's keep on doing these PowerPoints. And, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little sloppy today. I really apologize about that, but that's why I'm doing this preparation stream, so I'll be on point for tomorrow. Okay, vegetarian diet for a healthy planet, one more. I took this Bruce Munger, made this. So it's more of the same. Pollution of streams, rivers, and the coastal ocean, availability of fresh water, greenhouse gas emissions, sustainability of living marine resources. So we're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus that are outputs of uh, animal using livestock and that are one of the biggest uh, pollutants in water. Different problems, it could cause algae growth, there are different issues, uh, killing fish, killing different species, this, uh, the agricultural waste products gets into the water, and that uh, causes different processes. It could be either algae growth or just uh, changing the balance of the water that makes it impossible for certain species to survive. Here specifically, we're looking at uh, the algae process, which I have to look into more. You look in fertilizer, the more meat eating, the more things are needed to do it, the more fertilizer we use. Fertilizer generally you know, has nitrogen and phosphorus, which leads to soil erosion. And, uh, you know, so land, God forbid, is uh, the forests are cut down and then they're turned to pastures or, or farming areas. And the fertilizer eventually strips the soil of uh, being useful and can even turn into, you know, desertification of what of formerly very good land. You know, so the meat eating, straining the use of fertilizer. Corn, one of the biggest uses of feed for livestock, uh, is known to uh, cause damage to uh, land long term this concept of leaching and uh we get too scientific although th this is important and maybe after the debate if we get into these topics i'll try to go over and explain some of these more complicated scientific concepts of uh, that, that require some knowledge of chemistry and biology You know, we look at the Mississippi fertilizer that washes off fast cornfield and organic nitrogen and phosphorus that leaches from uh, 
manure pounds eventually drains into the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, even the, you have okay, Idaho, North, you know, Central America, where they're growing huge amounts of corn, but the fertilizer. So not only that land uh, gets uh, negative impacts from the vast amount of grains and uh, corn and different crops they're grown to feed the animals, it damages the water there. And it could even damage large sections of water that, you know, drain into the Mississippi and drain into the Gulf of Mexico and, uh, you know, serious ecological effects. And this has been well documented and reported on one of the most studied uh, things out there. Here they say there's the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that uh, you can't support life anymore due to pollution, lack of oxygen, more dead zones caused by too much fertilizer. And if you know, see it's in America, mostly on the East Coast, some on the West Coast, in Europe, around the coasts, in you know, Japan, different areas that uh, have really overdone it with fertilizer and uh, possibly permanently or long-term destroyed lots of land. So obviously, eat less meat, especially eat less factory meat. You were looking at uh, fertilizer use, like Mediterranean diet down here. Uh, would decrease much less than uh, you know, we're using now, as opposed to the projections if we continue on the same path, will require substantially more amounts of fertilizer, and we can see the damage to the environment that fertilizer is already doing. Freshwater. Your demand for freshwater populations increasing, and uh, but I said the demand for freshwater is more in order so that we could eat meat, the actual demand that people need of fresh water versus the demand of fresh water for agriculture and the demand of fresh water so that we could have our meat-eating lifestyle. Greenhouse gas emission, talked about this in the other slideshows. In the you know, marine resources, overfishing problems, that using fish to feed animals and the destroying the supply chain, the ecosystem of the fishes and disrupting and causing, God forbid, mass extinction. You decline in the top predator fish abundance in the world's ocean between 1955 and 1920. And then you see global fish production vastly increasing, you know, even though you're relatively eating fish is probably the worst the least bad of any of the forms. Uh, however, the fact that we take so much of it and uh, certain types overgrowing and, and uh, it's also damaging the mass uh, industrial fishing operations. So there's a large reliance of catches of lower trophic level wild fish populations called forage fish to use as fish meal for farmer fish. These fish are a natural food source for all sorts of consumers in the marine ecosystems, which causes a lack of genetic diversity of wild versions of the same species. So the UN Millennial Ecosystem Assessment Summary Points, humans have made unprecedented changes to the ecosystems in recent decades to meet growing demand for food, fresh water, fiber, and energy. These changes have weakened nature's ability to deliver other key services, such as purification of air and water, protection from disasters, provision of medicines. Among the outstanding problems identified by this assessment are the dire state of many of the world's fish stocks, the intense vulnerability of the 2 billion people living in dry regions to the loss of ecosystem services, including water supply, the growing threat to ecosystems from climate change, nutrient pollution. Human activities have taken the plant to the edge of massive wave of species extinctions, further threatening our own well-being and the well-being of all future generations. The pressures on ecosystems will increase globally in coming decades unless human attitudes and actions change. So in summary, switching to a vegetarian diet will have the following positive impacts on the global environment, decrease nutrient pollution of streams, rivers, and coastal oceans, conserve the ability of fresh water, reduce greenhouse gas emission, improve the state of living marine resources in our oceans. Okay, so I got one more PowerPoint. Okay, let me check the chat.
Yeah, it was interesting. I actually listened to David Duke talking about um, diet and uh, meat eating. And, uh, you know, so hope maybe we'll just, I assume that me and JF will be discussing this and talking about this tonight. And, you know, obviously Jews generally are meat eaters. So uh, it was largely Hindu influence that turned me into a vegetarian. So let me try this uh, last one, vegetarianism in Germany. I just like to say that relatively it's actually uh, Europe and white societies that are giving the biggest pushback against meat eating outside of the Hindu religious areas that uh, don't eat meat for religious reasons. So as we know, like in Germany, they made recently, it's illegal that you can't serve meat at uh, government functions. And a lot of this data is coming from Europe on this. So look at a little history, vegetarianism, Germany, 1867, Edward Baltzer from Liepix, founded of the, the German Natural Living Society. A year later, um, another society, the Women's Society, you know, currently, there's quite a few different vegetarian societies, if anyone's familiar with the Germany. Interesting World War II, the International Vegetarian Union held more meetings in the next couple of decades until 1935 when independent societies were made illegal and were forced to either join the Nazi living reform movement or close. The member of the Deutsche Vegetarian Boom conducted a ballot of their members and they voted to close on February 18, 1935. The Bund was dissolved. In 1945, the vegetarians reestablished themselves and after various reorganizations and name changes became the vegetarian Boon Deutschland in 1985. And obviously, you know, Germany, uh, Adolf Hitler is a famous vegetarian. There were other Nazis that were also vegetarians. Henry Ford is a vegetarian. So, you know, the vegetarians coming from all different peoples and belief patterns. Einstein quotes. Albert Schweitzer, theologian. Martin Luther is a lot of people claim that Luther was a vegetarian. Nina Hagen, never heard of her. See, Adolf Hitler. Um, 22 years old, first tried becoming vegetarian in an attempt to cure a stomach ailment. 1911 letter he wrote, it was nothing but a small stomach upset, and I am trying to cure myself through a diet of fruits and vegetables. 1942, secretary reported, they always avoided meat, uh, but there are some people that uh, maintain that he was no way ethical vegetarian. Schopenhauer, vegetarian, based on ethics. I mean, historically, the environmental damage wasn't so large from vegetarianism that it was mostly ethical, the ethical reasons why people were vegetarian. You know, bodybuilders will talk about famous bodybuilders who are vegetarian for the people who talk about need for protein. So just random, I thought I'd, I'd throw that in there, the vegetarianism in Germany. Okay. So I think I got eight people watching right now. Thank you for tuning in. Let me take it off screen share and just see what people are saying in the chat before I get into some more of the scientific studies. So I got Insane Hermit. And uh, I'm not sure what, just trying to read the chat here. Take a second, then I'm going to go into the studies. I finished my PowerPoints. And uh, and then I'm got the actual scientific studies, which is going to be the bulk of the presentation. We'll see how much I do of going through these studies, and hopefully they're interesting to people. I'm going to put the links in the chat. I'm just uh, doing something real quick. Sorry about that. And see if anything. Uh, it's interesting. I, I hopefully tomorrow, me and JF will be able to talk about evolution and. Uh, vegetarianism to say that maybe different societies um evolved together with animals so if you i'm, I'm not truly I'm, i don't really believe in evolution as we as everyone who's seen my shows know uh, but from an evolutionary perspective uh, that humans and animals have evolved together and you're know, like the nature of the cow has changed that the the cow now 
that uh, we use for largely meat or chicken that's evolved together with humans in a certain way or even to domestication, dogs, and that has occurred differently in different societies. So people are interested in identitarianism or uh, race realism to think about diet. You know, everyone mentions cuisine, uh, you know, multiculturalism and the different diets, uh, but even different animals, what we eat, is it possible that some races are more adapt to be vegetarian and some meat eaters? And, you know, presumably all societies would benefit from decreased meat consumption in the type of meat consumption and if you look at something getting out of whack if you're just looking at these cows that we have produced and uh, genetically modified and so i do hope to discuss that tomorrow thank you ben noak yeah and certainly the noakai laws include um it allows meat eating but but it includes uh you know certain care to the animal and, and we'll talk about the origins and you know so look at this you know our, where our humans actually carnivores and say the cooked meat you know actually humans are not carnivores we could really only consume the cooked meat and uh you know so look at that that, that uh you were man, where did man used to be on um, uh, carnivores and then once we discovered fire and cooked meat is that what led to evolutionary change and it'd be interesting to discuss theoretically just these thought experiments to tomorrow so let me re-enter screen share and uh I want to get some of these studies out here. Okay, so here, history of vegetarianism in the West. Make this a little bigger. Read through little parts of this just so people could see about the origins of vegetarianism in the West. And this is specifically from... One Society of Vegetarianism. For several millennia, a small percentage of humans throughout the world have abstained from eating muscle, fat, skin, and other body parts of non-human animals. Reasons offered for engaging in this practice included health, cruelty, hygiene, economics, vitality, aesthetics, ecology, temperance, frugality, pacifism, humanitarianism, and more. The diversity of motives has been demonstrated by the very high-profile influential vegetarians who have advocated their diet. The poet uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley felt not eating flesh was essential to placing humans back on the path of nature. Uh, Swami Shivananda thought its role in bringing about spiritual and psychic advancement. Albert Einstein believed it would beneficially influence the lot of mankind with physical effect on the human temperament. Religious doctrine with the most extensive history of influencing individuals to eschew meat is ahimsa, a Sanskrit word that roughly translates to without violence or without harm. Ahimsa is central to the lives of Jains in particular, but also Hindus. In the mid-1800s, those we now call vegetarians were referenced in a variety of ways. Some of the most common abstainers from animal food, eaters of a vegetable diet, and Pythagoreans. This final term is based on what are reputed to be the teachings of the Greek thinker Pythagoras, Despite how modern readers might interpret them, the first two descriptions typically did not suggest the avoidance of avian eggs or ruminant milk. For example, an essay on abstinence from animal food as a moral duty, Joseph Ritson wrote of a family diet, their provisions is chiefly oatmeal, potatoes, milk, and butter, no animal food whatsoever. William Alcott, first president of the American Vegetarian Society, authored Vegetarian Diet as Sanctioned by Medical Men and by Experience in All Ages, most of the cited medical men reported eating non-human milk and or eggs. Also to the second edition, Alcott added a recipe section with dishes like Sunderland pudding, which requires a teacup full of flour, three eggs, and a pint of milk. You know, so within Hinduism, meat, milk uh, is actually encouraged. And we look at the nature of the cow. Uh, one reason why the cow is uh, worshipped in, in parts of Hinduism is actually based on the fact that the cow produces more milk than it needs for itself. The cow's nature, the cow by nature is the most altruistic of all animals because it produces more milk than it needs for itself and it freely gives of the milk. And uh, there's a lot of studies on cows. Cows like to be milked. Cows will come to be milked. Cows enjoy giving their milk. They're naturally uh, designed in a way 
that they produce more milk than they need for their own offspring. And, uh, you know, so Hinduism, generally the Indian religions that are vegetarian are pro milk. And, and part of that, um, there is some logic to cow worship and you know, maybe we'll discuss that. So official society definitions, the word vegetarian is probably an English or American invention of the late 1830s. It was most likely coining the combining vegetable with the suffix Aryan. Some 19th century vegetarians claims it has been derived from the Latin word vegetus, meaning vigorous or lively. However, this was typically a contrived response to critics who noted their consumption of animal secretions and not merely vegetables. In either case, a secular organization formed in 1847 that adapted and popularized more than any other factor this new name for an ancient diet. The original objectives declared by the Vegetarian Society at their first convention, which took place in Ramsgate, England, to induce habits of abstinence from the flesh of animals as food by the dissemination of information upon the subject by means of tracts, essays, and lectures, providing the many advantages of a physical, intellectual, moral, moral character resulting from vegetarian habits of diet, and thus to secure through the association examples and efforts of its members the adoption of a principle which will tend essentially to increase of human happiness generally. In 1850, a convention was held in New York to establish the American Vegetarian Society. The objectives that were adopted are almost identical to those used by the original society three years earlier. Alcott organized this event with the Reverend William Metcalf of the Bible Christian Church, a group that had preached the school of non-human flesh and was key in helping form and financially support the England Society. After immigrating from England in 1817, his efforts to educate included self-published his 1840 sermon, Bible Testimony on Abstinence from the Flesh of Animals. Metcalf believed that the goals of his new organization should be to promote knowledge of the principles and an extension of the practice of a vegetable diet in the community to induce habits of abstinence from fish, flesh, and fowl as food and secure the adoption of a principle which would tend essentially to promote a sound mind and sound body. The London Vegetarian Society emerged in 1888, following three years as a branch of the original Vegetarian Society based in Manchester, the differences between these two English societies, which did not completely reunite until 1969, were primary tactical rather than ideological. Their credo, as presented in the 1891 advertisement, established for the purpose of advocating the total disuse of the flesh of animals as food and promoting instead a more extensive use of fruits, grains, nuts, and other products of the vegetable kingdom, and also to disseminate information as to the meaning and principles of vegetarianism by lectures, pamphlets, letters, to the press, and by these means and through the example and efforts of its members to extend the adoption of principles tending essentially to true civilization, to universal humanness, and to increase human happiness in general. So the total vegetarians, from the original definitions onwards, vegetarian has most frequently been used to denote abstinence from meat. This rejection of secretions taken from non-humans has never been integral to the term. A few years before the Vegetarian Society was established, John Smith wrote, fruits and perenica, the proper food of man in England, he predicted that as more correct notions respecting diet prevail, vegetables will not be prepared with animal matter except for eggs, milk, butter, cheese, to which few vegetarians object. Charles Forbes, in a 50-year food reform, a history of vegetarian movement in England, claimed that he had discovered nothing in the annals of vegetarian society to indicate that its founders desired to narrow down its objects beyond abstinence from what James Joins called corpse eating. Through a minority, though a minority, there have always been vegetarians who exclude uh, ruminants' milk and birds' eggs from their diet. Like their less strict comrades, they've been motivated by a variety of factors. It was not uncommon for vegetarians who lived in the 1800s and early 1900s, particularly those of the total variety, to also skew a few widely eaten plant-based foods. This resulted in what many contemporary readers would consider a rather insipid diet. In many cases, they were exercising opposition to stimulants. An influential proponent of the stance was Sylvester Graham, a Presbyterian minister who helped form the American Vegetarian Society and advocated several other lifestyle and food reforms, including avoidance of white flour. His lectures on the science of human life collected ideas and experience from a decade of speaking engagements. Graham opposed salt, spices, Tea, coffee, alcohol, tobacco, and other pure stimulants because they afford no nourishment and wear out the body by needlessly expending vital properties and organs. 
I'm going to skip through a little bit. As per non-human milk and eggs, he was slightly more equivocal. Both have stimulating properties, and eggs are perhaps more exciting to the system. However, many of his objections to eggs were satisfied by their being fresh and good, as well as not overcooked or prepared with extra oil. His arguments were all propelled by concern for human health. So his discussions of impure and unwholesome food fed to cows and slaves for milk purposes, along with factors like improper confinement and filthy stables, was ultimately related to the fact that what affects the health of a cow correspondingly affects the quality of her milk. After reviewing the vast amount of evidence in favor of milk as an important article in the diet of mankind, Graham stated that milk and vegetable diet is far better than flesh and vegetable diet. Despite this, he reports that eight years of very extensive experiment and careful observation have shaken many of my preconceived opinions concerning the sustainability, the suitability of milk and eggs as human food. For instance, he notes that the young of all mammiferous animals, including those of the human species, naturally subsist for a certain period exclusively on milk, but in proper time, instinctively begin to accustom themselves to other kinds of food adopted to their system. Graham's overall position, minus certain caveats, is perhaps best captured by the following. I'm convinced that as a general and permanent rule, the whole human family would do best after a certain period in very early life to subsist entirely on the products of the vegetable kingdom and pure water. William Alcott was far more hesitant than Graham to criticize non-human secretions, but he shared several of his viewpoints. 19, 1839, Alcott's Tea and Coffee, their physical, intellectual, and moral effect on the human system was published three years after a similar work on tobacco. So Graham, Alcott, and the majority of the early vegetarians belonged to or followed the guidance of the temperance movement, which reached its height in the mid-19th to earliest 20th century proponents of temperance which means self-restraint or moderation, focused their efforts on opposing alcohol described as insidious, tempting, and violently intoxicating. Brasson Alcott defined from his cousin William in the matter of consuming secretions taken from non-human animals. In 1843, along with his small but loyal following, Alcott established a short-lived community experiment called Fruitlands, on land in Harvard, Massachusetts, pursued by his comrade Charles Lane. Some of their goals were attaining simplicity in diet, plain garments, pure bathing, unsullied dwellings, open conduct, gentle behavior, kindly sympathies, and serene minds. A letter written with Lane at Fruit Lines includes a description of their eating habits. No animal substance, neither flesh, butter, cheese, eggs, nor milk, pollute our table or corrupt our bodies. Neither tea, coffee, molasses, nor rice tempts us beyond the bounds of indigenous Productions, our sole beverage is pure fountain water, the native grains, fruits, herbs, roots, dressed with the utmost cleanliness in regard to their purpose of edifying a healthy body, furnish the pleasant, pleasantest reflections and the greatest variety requisite to a supply of the various organs. Let's check, chat real quick. So Russell Troll was a physician who practiced hydropathic techniques and participated in the convention that formed the American Vegetarian Society and in 1852, founded the New York Hygienic, Hygiotherapeutic College, one of the first accredited medical schools to accept women and men on equal terms. 1910 book on the history of medicine presented a selection of stances, anti-tobacco, anti-drink, anti-flesh eating, anti-salt, anti-drugging, anti-slavery, anti-vaccination, so on and so on. So I'm going to skip through some of this, but I encourage people to read this, just a history of uh, vegetarianism in the West. In, uh, and the history of the debate of uh, whether people should eat eggs and uh, dairy products, which is a, a big debate among vegetarians. And we'll look at some of the ecological evidence of, uh, of that. So check the chat okay hopefully anyone has anything to add please do it in the chat hopefully it'd be some interesting uh discussion in the chat anyone's got any other links let's look here at uh health implications of a vegetarian diet and there's a lot of studies a lot of evidence on this and uh you know so i'm just going to cover some of it. And, you know, said so this is one of the single most researched topics 
in science, uh, you know, uh, and relative, you know, related to um, sociology is uh, vegetarianism and, and human health. So I, I looked through a, actually quite a few studies, but I tried to get one that would be, you know, so this is just one of many you could find. Abstract. There is now a significant amount of research that demonstrates the health benefits of vegetarian and plant-based diets, which have been associated with a reduced risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and some types of cancer, as well as increased longevity. Vegetarian diets are typically lower in fat, particularly saturated fat, and higher in dietary fiber. They are also likely to include more whole grains, legumes, nuts, soy protein, and other. And together with the absence of red meat, this type of eating plan may provide many benefits for the prevention and treatment of obesity, chronic health problems, including diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Although well-planned vegetarian or vegan diet can meet all the nutritional needs of an individual, it may be necessary to pay particular attention to some nutrients to ensure an adequate intake, particularly if the person is on a vegan diet. This article will review the evidence for the health benefits of a vegetarian diet and also discuss strategies for meeting the nutritional needs of the, those following a vegetarian or plant-based eating pattern. So vegetarian, someone who consumes a diet consisting mostly of plant-based foods, including fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and grains. Some vegetarians also consume eggs and dairy products. There are four types of vegetarian diets. The lacto-ovo vegetarian consuming dairy products and eggs, but no meat, poultry, or seafood. A lacto-vegetarian eats dairy products, but not eggs, meat, poultry, or seafood. An ovo vegetarian eats eggs, but no dairy products, meat, poultry, or seafood. And a vegan does not eat any animal products, including meat, fish, poultry, eggs, and dairy products. Many vegans will also avoid honey. 2009 nationwide poll conducted by the Vegetarian Review Resource Group estimated that approximately 3% of U.S. adults are vegetarian. And around 1% are vegan. So health benefits of vegetarian diet. Improved health is one of the many reasons people choose to adopt a vegetarian diet. And there is now a wealth of evidence to support the health benefits of a vegetarian diet. Research has found that vegetarians have lower rates of a number of health problems, including overweight and obesity, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, some cancers, gallstone, kidney stones, constipation, and diverter diverticular disease. Although vegetarians generally have a lower body mass index and tend to be more health conscious than non-vegetarian health outcomes remain better even when these factors are taken into account. Furthermore, a number of studies have shown increased longevity among vegetarians. It is likely that these benefits result from both the reduced consumption of potentially harmful dietary components, including saturated fat, cholesterol, animal protein, red meat, heme iron, and an increased consumption of the beneficial dietary components, including fruit, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and nuts, which are rich in dietary fiber, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. Vegetarian diets differ from non-vegetarian diets in many respects, but the most significant difference is the absence of red meat intake in a vegetarian diet. Research has linked higher intakes of red meat and processed meat with an increased risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, gastrointestinal diabetes, CVD, and other types of cancers. These findings are summarized in Table 1A, a large study investigating the association of a wide range of meat intakes with chronic disease and mortality found that both red and processed meat intakes were associated with modest increase in total mortality, cancer mortality, and CVD mortality. Low meat intake, on the other, time, other hand, has been associated with greater longevity. So we look, the, I encourage people to read the article. You know, I already showed a lot of this on the PowerPoints, um, you know, go through obesity and overweight. Research has consistently shown that vegetarians, and particularly vegans, are leaner than their omnivorous counterpart. Um, and there's been extensive studies that included tens of thousands of subjects. As said, um, this is one of the most single-studied issues in science. Vascular disease. We have these uh, parts. Take clockwise. So people who, you know, more scientifically inclined, I encourage people to open up the study and read through <coughs> this data. Hypertension, cancer, diabetes. So meeting nutritional disease. The American Dietetic Association supported the fact that in addition to their health benefits, well-planned vegetarian diets, including vegan diets, are nutritionally adequate 
and are appropriate for individuals during all stages of life. Some nutrients can be more difficult to obtain on a vegetarian diet, but careful planning and in some cases the use of fortified foods or supplements can ensure that an individual's nutrition needs are met while maximizing the health benefits of a vegetarian or vegan diet. What about protein? Um, sometimes people mention vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is only is found only in animal products, so a deficiency of this vitamin is a potential concern for anybody following a vegan or vegetarian diet or anyone who significantly restricts animal products. Serum levels of vitamin B12 are generally lower in vegetarians, especially vegans, decreasing with increasing duration of following the diet, although it can take several years for deficiency symptoms to develop. Anyone excluding animal products will eventually become deficient if their diet is not adequately supplemented. Recent findings from the epi study showed that in a cohort of 689 men, that uh, your know, vitamin B12 deficiency could be more common in vegetarians. Although plant food, including mushrooms, tempeh, miso, and sea vegetables are often reported to provide some B12, they're not a reliable source for this vitamin. These foods contain an inactive form of B12, which interferes with the normal absorption and metabolism of the active form in the body and will not prevent a deficiency. Recent research has found that some bioavailable vitamins B12 on the surface of the flesh of mushrooms. These amounts, however, are small and adequate. A reliable source of biologically active vitamin B12 is recommended on a regular basis. Let's talk about irons, zinc, calcium, um, essential fatty acids, vitamin D. So anyone who is a vegetarian encouraged to read this and have a well-balanced diet. And if they do need minor supplements to uh, supplement their diet, a lot of, you know, I said the uh, nutrition power bars fruit drinks uh, will include uh, these supplements within them so conclusion well-planned vegetarian diets are not only nutritionally adequate but also provide many health benefits particularly in the prevention and treatment of many chronic diseases in fact in western countries a vegetarian diet may present a significant advantage over meat-based diets and the number of studies have shown increased longevity in vegetarians although potentially lower in some nutrients carefully planning can help ensure bo both vegetarian and vegan diets meet all the current recommended intakes for essential nutrients as well as maximizing the intake of proactive components present widely in plant foods. In fact, a vegetarian diet may well be one of the best ways to meet population dietary guidelines. Okay, so check the chat. Eight people. I'm glad people are active in the chat. And uh, you know, this is purely like a self-help, uh, you know, I became vegetarian partly due to health reasons and partly due to um, association with Hinduism and thinking about it. And uh, okay, Glib, have a great night. Thanks for joining. Um, if you could tune into the debate tomorrow night, hopefully uh, that'll be good. You know, and JF obviously is a, you know, a chef in a, a large brand of meat eating and very knowledgeable in biology, so hopefully it'll be a nice discussion. That's why I'm, you know, putting so much effort into preparing. And uh, you, know, your vegetarianism comes together like the rise of yoga and spread of health and uh, health benefits. One of the largest reasons, and and my health has drastically increased. Um, you know, like I was never super obese, but I've been overweight, and vegetarian helped me lose weight. Although, you know, I'm a little overweight now and you could be overweight and vegetarian, you know, eat a bunch of potato chips or fat. It doesn't matter if you're vegetarian, it's going to put weight on you. But in terms of uh, my health is personally, I uh, could attest to the positive health effects of vegetarian diet. So I want to show, uh, you know, anyone who knows Luke Ford, you know, knows he's a Seventh-day Adventist and he's a vegetarian. And there has been massive studies on vegetarianism most directly related to Seventh-day Adventists because you have these very large communities of people that are vegetarian their whole life and they've uh, participated in studies that have included uh, some of them hundreds of thousands of people and that's where anyone who's seen numbers and statistics like vegetarians uh, you know could live longer on average by like uh, 10, 15 years. I mean, these studies are very serious. I mean, you consider like you want to increase your lifespan by 10 years. Um, 
becoming a vegetarian, I mean, it's a, that's why lots of people do it, you know, especially health and science conscious people do it. And there's lots of scientific evidence to show that these things are accurate. And so let's look at, you know, this famous study of Seventh-day Adventists. You know, this a total of 96,469 Seventh-day Adventist men and women recruited between 2002 and 2007, uh, from which an analytic sample of 73,308 participants remained after exclusion. So here you have a study of almost 100,000 people over five years. And there's been more studies from Adventists. I mean, there's a lot of studies because there's a lot of populations that are vegetarian their whole life. And so it's relatively easy to study these outcomes. Well, there, there will be a uh, you know, certain uh, nothing within this is completely empirical, and there are complaints on these studies. So we're we're looking here at like death rates, um, you know, how many people died during this close to six year period versus uh, compared to the, la the larger population, and the uh, conclusion: vegetarian diets are associated with low, lower all cause mortality and with some reductions in cause specific mortality results appeared to be more robust in males. These favorable associations should be considered carefully by those offering dietary guidance. Possible relationship between diet and mortality remains an important area of investigation. Previous studies have identified dietary factors associated with mortality. Those found to correlate with reduced mortality include nuts, fruit, cyber fiber. I go on, I encourage people to read this, but I mean, the point of the study is just going to be that uh, vegetarians live longer and have better health outcomes. And uh, we have this Christian community of Seventh-day Adventists. You know, people are familiar with uh, Luke Ford, uh, father, very famous Adventist, who mentions this very often, but it's been studied. It's very well documented. So I'm not going to go through. I'm not going to read through this uh, too much, but I encourage people to read it, and you'll see like how many people died uh, from this group population-based, uh, you know, vegetarian versus non-vegetarian, and uh, to mathematically quantify uh, the health benefits of being vegetarian, you know, based on a study of 100,000 vegetarians. And you here we have the divide up between vegan, lacto-active, pesco, and semi, and the different uh, likeliness. You know, vegetarian death rate here put to one, and uh, the different uh, less likeliness of these things from the different dietary patterns. And you say any of these forms is better than meat eating, and some of them significantly better. Hazard ratio. Well, these results demonstrate an overall association of vegetarian dietary patterns with lower mortality compared with non-vegetarian dietary patterns. They also demonstrate some association with lower mortality of the pesco vegetarian, vegan, and lacto ovo vegetarian diet, specifically compared with the non-vegetarian diet. Some associations of vegetarian diets with lower cardiovascular mortality and lower non cardiovascular non-cancer mortality were observed. Vegetarian diets have been associated with more favorable levels of car cardiovascular risk factors, and nutrient profiles of the vegetarian diet pattern suggest possible reasons for reduced cardiovascular risk, such as lowered saturated fat and higher fire for consumption. So the strengths of the study include the large number of participants consuming various vegetarian diets, the diverse nature of this cohort in terms of sex, race, geography, and socioeconomic status, enhancing generalizability, the low use of tobacco and alcohol, making residual confounding from these unlikely, the shared religious affiliation of the cohort, which may lead to greater homogeneity, homogeneity across several possible unmeasured co-founders, enhancing internal validity in the price dietary pattern, definitions based on measured food intakes rather than self-identification of dietary patterns. Analysis is limited by relatively early follow-up. In fact, I think this study did have a follow-up. This is over 10 years ago. Um, you know, anomalies with British vegetarians. 
So in conclusion, in a large American cohort, we found the vegetarian diet patterns were associated with lower mortality. The evidence that vegetarian diets or similar diets would produce meat consumption may be associated with a lower risk of death should be considered carefully by individuals as they make dietary choice by those offering dietary guidelines. So, you know, the famous studies about vegetarians living longer, it's been quantified to some people up to 15 years in different studies. And I said these studies have included hundreds of thousands of people, some of them as uh, the Seventh-day Adventist promoting vegetarians have been happy to participate in these studies. Okay, so let's look one more in health and then we're gonna go to environment. Add this uh, link. Here's a uh, 16 studies on vegan diets. Do they really work? So, and we could click and read through these. You know, say so if you click on this, the study opens. And uh, I've looked. I looked through a few of these. You know, time limited, and, and there's a lot to study. So there's thousands of studies on vegetarianism. Um, So here we got the uh, weighing at all effects of vegetarian diet on blood lips, lipids, systematic review of meta-analysis of random control trials. A vegetarian diets effectively lowered blood levels of total LDL, HDL, and non-HDL cholesterol. So you know, vegetarianism, vegetarianism will lower your cholesterol. A second study, both diets lowered heart disease risk in children and doubt. And adults, however, the vegan diet more generally affected the children's weight and the parents' cholesterol and blood sugar levels. So, I mean, these aren't particularly interesting, but you just see there's a lot of different studies that demonstrate that not consuming meat is better for your health. So, I don't know if I. Oops, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a mega stream and just read through these like I did with consciousness, which was more interesting to me. Although I'm a vegetarian, this is interesting to me. Let me check the chat. Historicity, I got a juicer, but will likely always be a meat eater, especially fish. Essential, longest life expecting people have all have seafood centered diets. I mean, we can look at some of those studies, but not, I mean, <coughs> they show that the longest lifestyle are actually for those who uh, don't eat uh, even milk or seafood or there's different studies and there's debates on it and I'm not saying you have to become a vegetarian but certainly limiting your meat meat uh, intake will be better for your health and the environment if you don't buy into the moral arguments I'm not going to be going too much into the moral arguments tonight um, but uh, minus the moral arguments just saying limit your meat intake be careful about your meat intake if you do eat meat eat high quality meat and uh, that would be minus the moral arguments just the health and uh, environmental reasons so this one's pretty interesting let's get to the environment and we're looking at uh, your population increases what's happening with the environment and uh, you know this study looks at different scenarios for ecological sustainability and we're going to say that um, Stopping meat eating is one of the most important factors to preserving the environment. The study 2016 exploring the biophysical option space for feeding the world without deforestation. Safeguarding the world's remaining forests is a high priority goal. We assessed the biophysical option space for feeding the world in 2050 in a hypothetical zero deforestation world. We systematically combined realistic assumptions on future yields, agricultural areas, livestock feed and human diets for each scenario we determine whether the supply of crop products meets the demand and whether the grazing intensity stays without plausible limits we find that many options exist to meet the global food supply in 2050 without deforestation even at low crop yield levels within the option space individual scenarios differ greatly in terms of biomass harvest, cropland demand, and grazing intensity, depending primarily on the quantitative and qualitative aspects of human diets. Grazing constraints strongly limit the option space without the option to encroach into natural or semi-natural land. 
Trade volumes will rise in scenarios with globally converging diets, thereby decreasing the food self-sufficiency of many developing regions. Future land use faces several inter interconnected challenges. Um, terrestrial ecosystems play a key role in global climate system, host a substantial fraction of global biodiversity, and provide ecosystem services that are essential for humans, including food, fiber, energy, water, and air purification, microclimate regulation, and protection from natural hazard. Three quarters of the Earth's terrestrial ice free surface is currently under human use, and one quarter of global potential net primary production is appropriated by humans. Land use associated with many other environmental effects, such as eutrophication, pollution, biodiversity loss, or climate effects reaching levels that jeopardize the provision of ecosystem services to society, exploring ways that allow feeding and fueling the growing global population while safeguarding the life-supporting functions of ecosystems is generally recognized as an urgent sustainability challenge. Protecting the remaining forest ecosystems is central Okay, so, so in this study, we systematically explore the options and constraints resulting from a hypothetical zero forestation boundary condition for agricultural production, thereby explicitly assessing limitations to grazing. We explore the individual role of supply side measures, including cropland output intensification, cropland expansion, efficiency measures in livestock systems, and demand side measures. For each of these parameters, we collected published forecasts for 2050 and incorporated them into a consistent biomass balance model to assess their combined effects for each scenario, which is a unique combination of individual variants of five parameters. It calculates biomass demand and supply balances for the globe and for 11 rural regions, along with the average grazing intensity and regional biophysical trade balances. In the figure... <laughs> encourage people to read through this. We assess the feasibility of 500 scenarios. Feasibility was defined as a situation in which global food demand is matched by cropland supply and livestock grazing intensity stays within ecological thresholds. Trade is assumed to balance deficits or regional production and consumption for all feasible scenarios, assuming no trade barriers exist. The option space is defined as the sum of all feasible scenarios. Our analysis reveals the large range of options exist to feed a no deforestation world. Nearly two thirds of the calculated 500 calculated scenarios are classified as feasible or probably feasible, even with low cropland yield levels or rich diets. But not when these two are combined, cropland constraints and grazing constraints are approximately equally frequent. Biomass harvest, cropland demand, and grazing intensity vary broadly within the option space, largely depending on diets. Grazing constraints strongly limit the option space in a world with moderate to high cropland expansion. Within the option space, trade volumes will rise if more regionally equal per capita diet is adopted and no encroachment of farming into natural, semi-natural land is assumed. So results. An overview of the option space according to our scenario calculations displayed in figure two, more than 40% of all scenarios are not feasible. 18% of all scenarios are limited by cropland availability, 16% by limits to grazing intensity, and 7% by uh, concomitants of both restraints. Whereas all vegan scenarios and 94% of vegetarian scenarios are feasible, approximately two thirds of the BAU diet and only a small fraction of the rich diet are found to be feasible. With high yields, 71% of all scenarios are feasible compared with only 39% if organic yields are assumed. Apparently, the increased area demand resulting from low yield renders scenarios with richer diets unfeasible. The expansion of cropland into grazing land enlarges the option space, but grazing constraints become increasingly important. The rich diet combined with intermediate yield levels is feasible only in cases where a large share of high quality grazing land is converted into cropland. Such scenarios, however, are often constrained by threshold related to grazing intensity owing to the increased grazing land availability. So here is the figure two. And uh, by these 500 different scenarios and uh, your different, uh, the main thing I wanted to pull out from the study was 
that the vegetarian the all of the vegan scenarios are feasible and most of the vegetarian scenarios are feasible almost all like not over well over 90 percent so it's saying for population ecology deforestation um the scenarios that uh, can maintain the populations that are expected to come to this planet a vegetarian is critical and uh, you know there's a lot of studies i mean i look through some of the associated studies in uh that have been quoted in other studies So according to our analysis, human diets are the strongest determinant of the biophysical option space, stronger than yields or cropland availability. Unsurprisingly, vegan diets and diets with a low share of livestock products show the largest number of feasible scenarios in line with other studies. So this is the only study that's shown this, representing pathways that may that also make it possible to avoid the otherwise virulent grazing constraints and significantly reduce the option space. Other factors such as high yields or intensive livestock systems do not show such a strong effect on the number of feasible scenarios and do not necessarily reduce cropland demand or grazing intensity because the land sparing effect can be annihilated by rich diets. These findings underpin the insight of other studies that stress the importance of demand side measures for sustainability. And I think I see my roommate coming in, so I might try to cut this to an end. Yeah, I have here also the United Nations uh, report on the environmental constraints of uh, production. It's an interesting read, over 100 pages. I said this is extremely well studied, but you know, what goes into the you know, consumption and production of uh, food. So I'm going to take it off screen share and uh, you know, I see my roommate just pulled up so I might uh, stop the stream. I appreciate uh, people coming on. You know, this was mainly a preparation for my debate with JF and I wanted, you know, to get used like eutrophication when I was doing the PowerPoints. Um, the, the word eutrophication wasn't coming straight to my tongue. So, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to do this study and you have these numbers and data fresh in my head, although I've, I've been debating this issue for over five years now, and I debated it as a meat eater against vegetarians, and then as a vegetarian against meat eaters for many years. I've read hundreds of articles on it, uh, many books on it, uh, listened to lectures on it. Um, but you know, I just want to have on my page some of the recent studies, and hope the debate tomorrow will go well. And I appreciate everyone who tuned in. You know, the Jewish holiday season is over now. The last holiday, Simchas Torah, ended was sundown. You know, so that's the stream. Um, so hopefully I'll have time to do more streaming, maybe some more Ask the Rabbis or see how it goes. And uh, I appreciate everyone who tuned in. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to catch the debate tomorrow. So I'm going to sign off and wish everybody the best. Thank you. And I, like usual, I will add the timestamps and studies in the description, uh, hopefully tonight.